my thinking. And then we have risk-taking. Now, this is also very important. I'm sure in your business, um, those of you who are involved in managing people, um, you don't want someone who's risk-averse. At the same time, you don't want someone who's reckless. So it's a very dodgy and thin line that we need to understand about how we manage risk. And Obama said, you know, that um, the financial crisis was due to recklessness and greed. So let's think a bit about that. And if you ask a neuroscientist to talk about recklessness, they will look for neurological cases of brain damage where people have been unusually reckless. And the very famous case was in the 1860s by this man, Phineas Gage. You may have heard of him. He worked in Vermont. He was the foreman on a railway gang. And it was his job to use something called a tamping iron, a very thick rod, to push explosive down a hole to then clear the, uh, the lines, clear the ground for the lines to be laid at that time when they were going um, with the railroads in the States. And then you can imagine what happened one day as he was pushing the explosive down with this big rod, uh, the explosive went off prematurely and drove the rod through his brain. I'm about to show you a picture of him. Um, I'm sure because you're all in the business you're in, you're not squeamish. But if you are squeamish and you've just had breakfast, you may want to close your eyes and ask your neighbor to nudge you when the thing goes off. So here he is. Um, and you can see the damage was very severe. And the reason I'm telling you the story and why it's remarkable was you might have thought that he died or suffered such terrible damage that he was some kind of vegetable. Not so remarkable as it might seem. What happens, he lived to tell the tale. He could see and hear just fine. He could walk. He actually went back to work, even though he had a hole through his head. Um, and these being the very kind of cruel days of no social services and so on. But it was only after several months that people noticed a difference. It wasn't in his movement or his senses. It was in the kind of person he was. And among other things, he became very, very reckless. This is not good for someone dealing with explosive. So, um, so what happened was, uh, and he became such a non-team player, that he, he ended up, funnily enough, if you're interested, as a fairground freak, uh, where he earned much more money showing off his wound in a fairground. And he earned so much money, he could afford to become an alcoholic and actually died of alcohol poisoning. That was his, that's Phineas Gage, that's his life. But anyway, so the area of the brain that was damaged is an area that's very important in the human brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is shown here. And in our brains, it occupies 33% of our brains. Whereas in chimps, our nearest relatives, it's 17%. And if anyone is keen on cats, that's only 3%. So you can see in evolutionary terms, this area of the brain is super sophisticated and very, very new. Um, many people say, what does it do? Which I think is a silly question because you don't have autonomous brains within brains. But certainly we know its connections are greater than any other brain area. So it kind of is cohesive. It kind of pulls all the brain together. And we do know that if it's damaged, then cognitive subtle things ensue, such as being more reckless. So let's think about, about the, um, the uh, underactive prefrontal cortex. Interestingly enough, there's other ways and conditions and situations where we see recklessness and an underactive prefrontal cortex. One of them, interestingly enough, is obesity. And of course, that is one of the big problems that's facing us this century. And you can see in this study, which was published relatively recently, um, they found that obese people are more reckless in gambling tasks. And moreover, people who are large compared to their height, who have a high body mass index of BMI, they have less activity, again, in their prefrontal cortex. So what could be going on? Well, there's yet another group of people who have an underactive prefrontal cortex. And these are schizophrenic people. These are lying on their back. The areas concerned are shown by the arrow. Um, what do we know about schizophrenia? Well, we know that they are rather like children. A schizophrenic person isn't a split personality. They're split more from reality. They put a lot of emphasis on the outside, which seems to have bright glowing colors. Um, they're easily distracted. And like small children, they can't interpret proverbs. If you say to a schizophrenic, what does it mean people who live in glass houses mustn't throw stones? They will say something like, well, if your house is made of glass and I throw a stone, your house is going to break. A bit like my brother with the candle. Yeah? So you take the word very literally. So we can say that there are similarities between children and schizophrenics, that they're easily distracted, they have a short attention span, they have an inability to think metaphorically, to interpret priors, and above all, they have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. What's very interesting is in children, the prefrontal cortex only comes on stream in late teenage years, early 20s. It's active, but it's only fully active very late in life. So you see here an example of evolution and personal development very close together with this prefrontal cortex being a very sophisticated new part of the brain. Now, what they could all have in common, I'd like to suggest, you might see where this is headed now, is a press of the senses. If you think about it, 
Children, as we've seen, are very much dominated by distraction and by the bird flying in the sky. Anyone who eats knows the consequences of eating, but for obese people, people with high BMI, they say it's the thrill of the food, the thrill of the taste that trumps the consequences. And that fits with reckless because anyone who gambles knows the consequence of gambling. Everyone knows the consequence of gambling, but it's the thrill. It's the excitement of the roulette wheel, the excitement of the horse past the finishing post that apparently for compulsive gamblers is the real excitement. And similarly with schizophrenics, as you can see here in this lovely series of paintings, a very famous series of paintings, the top left is a cat, and I'm sure everyone would recognize that as a cat, but by the time the disease has deteriorated, you can see bottom right that no one, but no one would recognize that as a cat. So what we've done is we've gone from cognitive to sensory here. And as you can probably see where this is headed now. So that fits in with recklessness. Now, I said the other day about, or the other minute, about yuck and wow. And when I was talking uh, to a journalist about this, because I talk quickly, she mistyped this as yuck a wow. Yeah. But what was astonishing, and the reason I'm mentioning it, is that overnight this went viral. And there were like 75,000 hits on Google in 24 hours with this term. You can see here the first church of yuck wow, t-shirts on yuck wow. You might choose to Google on it. Um, but it clearly, for me, showed that it captured many people's attention and for some had a great appeal. There we are. First Church of Yakawa welcomes breezy people into a world with no consequences. Okay, and I think that when you play a computer game, it's a very dangerous lesson to learn that actions don't have consequences. And you're just living in the moment. So let's think about it. When you're playing a computer game, you're excited, highly aroused. Many people, especially for World of Warcraft, become addicted. And for many, otherwise they wouldn't do it, one could say it's rewarding. Now, in brain terms, we know there is a common chemical pathway. It's not the chemical for arousal or the chemical for addiction, but there is a very important chemical that has a very fountain-like distribution in the brain that is related very closely to all these things, and that's a chemical you may have heard of called dopamine. And we know that dopamine is like a sort of fountain in the base of the brain here, where it goes to many areas, but there's one area in the outer layer of the brain alone that it goes to, and that is the prefrontal cortex. And what it does there is it inhibits it. So we can put these things, hopefully, together. I'd like to suggest that usually we're in two basic modes, where we have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex versus one where it's active. Here you have strong feelings. Here thinking dominates. So we'll call it sensory versus cognitive. Here you're living in the moment. You're in the here and now, distracted from one sense to another. Here you have your life story, the past, the present. I don't know why I've put fantasy rather than future, but perhaps everyone's future is a fantasy. I don't know. Here the external environment is dominating. Here internal perceptions dominate. You have a unique sense of identity and continuity. Here what you see is what you get. Nothing means anything. It's just what it is. Here you have a personalized meaning. You don't just see an abstract load of visual patterns. It's a face that may be your mother. This, you have a reduced sense of self because you're just the passive recipient. Yuck and wow and wow and wow. Here, you have a strong continuity, a strong identity in yourself. Here, there's no time and space, you're just there. Here, you have episodes with clear time and space reference. This is mainly the brain of infants and children and this of older children and adults. This is characterized by more dopamine and this by less dopamine. Now, until very recently, this has been how we've always been. And what fascinates me is even when we're adults, we sometimes choose wine, women, and song, drugs and sex and rock and roll. And all those things have one thing in common, which is letting yourself go, blowing your mind, losing your mind. The very word ecstasy in Greek is to stand outside of yourself. And human beings have always done this. We've always wanted to have, from time to time, we've always wanted to have a sensational time. If I said to you, let's go out now, let's all go out and have a cognitive time, I don't think anyone would come with me here. <laughs> So we've always wanted to have times when we've let ourselves go, when we've gone back to the world of the senses. Yeah? There's nothing wrong with that, but what I fear is that the new world is going to skew this erstwhile healthy balance, if you like, and that when you have an environment that encourages all the things on the left, we will not develop the things on the right. And that's my concern for the young brain. Briefly onto the adult brain. Um, there's two technologies that are, are coming up. I don't know if anyone here is dealing with nanotechnology, the science of the very small, which is engineering. For those of you without brilliant vision on the back here, we have one guy saying, excuse me, where's the nanotechnology department? 
And here on the right, we have the typical scientist saying you just trod on it. By the way, ladies, look how scientists are portrayed. Someone was talking about this. Yeah. They're always ugly middle-aged men in you know, kind of suits and ties. Yeah, bald usually. Anyway, so that's nanotechnology. Now, what briefly can we say about this? Um, well, of course, it's a bit like explaining plastics to someone in the Middle Ages. You know, there's going to be so much change in terms of the material world. And I can't comment on that. I'm not a material scientist. My interest is in biology. And I think certainly we're soon going to have devices that breach the firewall of the brain and body. As someone once said, imagine going in and cleaning your teeth in the bathroom mirror and the toothbrush says to you, you better watch out, you could lose all your teeth in 10 years' time. And somewhat sobered, you go and urinate in the lavatory and the lavatory pan speaks to you and it says, you know, you better get yourself checked out for diabetes. We've analyzed your urine stream as you're peeing. Yeah? So it could mean going to the bathroom as a whole new hazardous interactive experience with these so-called things that think. But gradually, even as you'll see here, the firewall, I think, of the brain will be breached. And here you can see already that nerve cells can grow on integrated circuits. After all, they are brilliant electronic components. They've had the whole of evolution to become that. This is someone called Fromherz. So you can have a neurochip already. Here we have a little circuit board with, like there, the triffids. You can see there a cell just sort of splodging on the things, and then you can have an array of them um, where there's a, at the front again, or with good vision, I hope can see this lovely filigree arrangement between the, between the cells and the... So this is a neurochip. You'll have hybrid biocomputers. And that um, follows, therefore, that if you can have brains on chips, could you put chips in the brain? And there's some brilliant work being done at Duke University by this Brazilian guy, Miguel Nicolailes, um, where what he's done is to actually implant into the brains of paralyzed people, quadriplegic people, um, a device that can actually um, pick up and register and store the electrophysiological signature that a patient will have before they want to move. And that is then stored so that when that person generates that particular pattern again, that will actually activate a prosthetic limb. So if you like, he's breaching the firewall of mind over matter, of thought even, which was never regarded ever as the sort of something that a neuroscientist would get a hand on. So we're already seeing how the nanotechnology world is actually blurring the distinction between your body and the outside world. On the one hand, it's good for early warning devices, it's good for um, people who are paralyzed, but how do you feel about third-party access to your brain and body? That's an interesting, interesting thought. Um, here's one other ramification of that from Ian Pearson, this human-machine convergence starting off a million and a half years ago with Homo habilis, our earliest ancestor who used tools, and then we stood up Homo erectus. Neanderthals, as we know, didn't last very long in favor of Homo sapiens, us. All this took, I say, a million and a half years, but now he says we're dying out. This is people like me, I suppose, Homo sapiens luditus, who don't like it, in favor of Homo machinus. Yeah. Um, and I, that, in a sense, we kind of smile at, but if we do think about trying to enhance ourselves by um, external means or by nanotechnology, we ought to be very careful. There's this movement called transhumanism, which someone has said, you know, started off as a sort of joke, but someone now has said this could be one of the world's most dangerous ideas because it does suggest that we are not happy with who we are. We want to be supranormal, and guess what? That will go to the technologically advanced countries or people to do that, and that will open up a whole ethical world that I don't think anyone would want to go down. We want to be ourselves, surely, and make the most of what we have, not just to be in some kind of arms race. But that is one of the issues that do face the next generation. The next, and finally, is biotechnology. Wrapping through this, health. Um, as you may know, we're going from 400 to 4,000 drug targets. Um, because of the genetic technologies, we can now have pharmacogenomics, which means that we can minimize, we, people can minimize side effects as.